हेलो एवरीवन दिस इज अनुराधा शर्मा एंड यू आर वाचिंग माय चैनल आल्स विद अनुराधा फर्स्ट यू हैव सम टाइम टू लुक एट क्वेश्चंस 1 टू 6 Good morning, Taz Car Insurance. How can I help you? Hello. I was wondering if you could give me a quote for my car, please. I'd like to insure it for a period of 12 months. Certainly. I need to take down a few details first of all. Can I have your name, please? Certainly. It's James Bartolo. Sorry. Can you say that again, please? Sure. James Bartolo. That's B-A-R-T-O-L-O. Okay, thanks. And your date of birth? It's the 1st of the 8th, 1973. Great. And can you give me your address, please? Sure. It's 146 Eastern Road, Chester. Fabulous. Now, is the insurance for just yourself? No. Actually, my wife drives the car, too. Her name is Alice Jackson, and her date of birth is the 23rd of the 4th, 1968. That's okay. I just need to write yes or no, and the make and model of the car you wish to insure. It's a 1998 Ford Laser. OK. And do you have any idea of the value of the car? Yes, it's around £4,000. I only bought it about a week ago. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. OK. And do either you or your wife have any previous convictions or disqualifications? I'm sorry we have to ask this question, but of course it affects the price of the insurance cover. Not a problem. No, actually we both have clean driving licences. Nothing so far, touch wood. Good. So I can write none for that question. Now, who were you previously insured with? Uh, with Aitken Insurance. I'm sorry, could you spell that? Yes, it's A-I-T-K-E-N. I actually have a three years no claims bonus too. Great. That will bring the price down a little for you too. OK, if you just give me a few minutes, I'll work out a price for you now. That looks like it will be £275 per year. That sounds good to me. Can I pay for that now over the telephone? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. Helen, the concept of vegetarianism seems to have interested a number of our listeners, who have sent in some questions. To begin, what made you want to become a vegetarian? 
Well, when I was 16, I had friends who were vegetarian and they introduced me to the idea. My parents were typical of their generation and ate meat at least three or four times a week, so I didn't really think about it too much until a few years later. It was while I was at university that I really thought about it and decided that it was unfair to eat meat when there are so many alternatives available. Is there anything you miss about not eating meat? Um, no, not really. As I said, there are so many substitutes available these days, perhaps the most important of which comes from the soya bean. Soya is so versatile and is the staple substitute for most vegetarians. So what about the nutritional value of vegetarian food? Isn't it true that there are some vitamins that you can't get from soya or vegetables alone? Surely people need these vitamins. Yes, that's correct. But actually there is only one vital vitamin that is only present in meat. That's vitamin B12. Most vegetarians are aware of the implication of this and actually take B12 supplement in the form of tablets. Of course, the way you cook vegetables is also very important in preserving vitamins. Many countries, particularly the UK, have a reputation for overcooking vegetables. Water-soluble vitamins, you know, where the vitamins are dissolved into the water, are often lost. Vitamin C is a common example. However, the loss of vitamins can be avoided by microwaving or steaming vegetables, which is what I do whenever I cook. Some people don't want to change their cooking habits too much, so if you do boil them, simply cut down on the cooking time. So, a vegetarian diet is fairly healthy then? Oh yes. A lot of people believe that vegetarianism is unhealthy, but that's actually not the case. Vegetarians are actually considerably healthier than many meat eaters. Consider for a minute the health aspects of the incredible amount of meat this country and others like it consume. The statistics for beef eating, for example, are quite frightening. The world figure for beef consumption is slightly less than 11 kilograms per person each year. Yet in Europe, the average consumption is nearly double that at 21 kilos per person. And in the USA, it is even worse, with the average person eating 44 kilograms of beef every year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So are you suggesting that people stop eating meat altogether and everyone adopts a vegetarian lifestyle? No, not at all. Even in the healthiest diets, there is still a place for meat, but it should be eaten in moderation. Many nutritionists think of foods in terms of a pyramid, with the foods we can eat relatively freely at the bottom and the foods we should carefully restrict at the top. The majority of our diet should be composed of cereals, which would go on the bottom row of the pyramid. In this category could also be included such things as rice and pasta. Next, a good diet is followed by a roughly equal amount of vegetables and fruit. I have at least two servings a day of fruit and vegetables whenever possible. In decreasing quantities, you can then eat dairy foods, eggs, cheese, etc. Almost at the top of the food pyramid comes fish, carefully prepared of course, not dripping in oil or batter, and white meat. Chicken, for example, is a comparatively healthy meat, but again, a lot of this comes down to preparation methods. Right at the top of the pyramid come the ingredients of far too many Western meals, red meat and potatoes. It is particularly in that area that I would suggest moderation. Well, thank you very much, Helen. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are interested in your views. How could they find out more about the health benefits of vegetarian options? Well, there are lots of websites and books on healthy eating and vegetarianism, but it is always important to remember to consult your doctor before making any radical changes to your diet or lifestyle. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear the rest of the talk about family history. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So that's a few ideas about getting information, but what about methods of recording it? Of course, you can just write down what family members say, but it's even better if you can use a tape, so that you can record them as they're talking. Then you don't have to worry too much about making mistakes. You'll always be able to listen to it again. But whatever method you do use to record information, remember that it's very important to make a note of exactly how you got it. So, if you are using tape, always start the recording by saying the date and the place, as well as the name of the person you're interviewing. So, apart from people's memories. Where else can you find information? Well, there are all sorts of documents, and they can be extremely useful. People keep lots of kinds of documents in the home, like、uh, photos or letters or diaries or birth certificates. And some people keep things from newspapers, like obituaries. Obituaries are announcements of a person's death. And they usually contain a lot of detail about that individual, like address, occupation, date of death, as well as the names and ages of the widow or widower and the dead person's children. So, be creative. Look around your home or the home of your relatives for any items that might contain clues, such as these about your family history. Okay. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Now you'll find that you'll collect a lot of information, so you'll need to record it in an organised way. I'd recommend that you use an ancestor chart,、uh, like this one here. <laughs> Can you all see? Yeah. Ancestor charts act like maps. They link four or five generations in a family tree, so they're very convenient, and they don't cost anything. You can get as many as you like. You just download them free from the internet. Then you fill them out as you go along, and for each individual, you record all the key information next to their full name. <laughs> It's very convenient. Now, at this point. I'd just like to give you a couple of tips about filling in the ancestor sheet. First of all, I'd advise you to use pencil, at least until you have definite evidence for the information you're recording. Secondly, as well as recording official names, I mean given names, it's worth writing any nicknames down. You know, these are the short names that people call you when they know you very well. And you can show them by using quotation marks. That's ancestor charts. Then they really do save a lot of work. Now, before I show you how to go about confirming the information. You collected... That is the end of part three.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Nine. Listen to the second part of our lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. River dance is not just an expression of self-confidence, a kind of culturally interesting pop song. It tells the story of a people through song and dance. It tells the story of the people whose spirit was broken by an event which occurred in the middle of the last century but continued to affect the society until 1961, the Great Famine. What is a famine? In 1840, the official population of Ireland was 8 million. They were largely poor and living in the countryside. They were beginning to have an interest in independence and perhaps had things been different, Ireland might have been independent much earlier. But there was a serious problem in the agricultural system. All crops were grown to pay the rent of the land and all that was grown to eat was the potato. This was fine until the potato crop failed, as it did from 1845 to 1848. The stories of what happened in those times live on in the popular culture of Ireland, and I won't tell them here, but the result was that two million people died or left the country by 1851. When you realise that the population continued to go down until 1961, you can realise what a disastrous effect this famine had on the people. Compared with China, imagine if the famine of 1960 reduced the population by a quarter and it kept falling to less than half of its pre-famine figure. Anybody with ideas left and went to England, America or Australia. The people left behind were broken by their experiences and, in effect, the famine and its consequences put an end to all serious development in the country until well into this century. The Irish in Ireland lost all hope and self-confidence and much of our modern culture is about the sadness of that time and the sorrow of saying goodbye to those who left and left well into this century. Ireland has the highest emigration rate of any country in Europe for the last two centuries. We even have an expression for this saying goodbye. It is called the American Wake. It means the ceremony, like that of a funeral for someone going to America because you will never see him or her again. Do you know why there is Irish music on the film Titanic? It is because most of the people killed were Irish. The leaving continued until the 1970s, because independence in 1921 was followed by a civil war and an economic depression. Almost every family in Ireland has relatives abroad, and up to the 60s in some places, of a class of 30 graduating from high school all left. Along the west coast, closed up houses from that time falling into ruin are still common. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos.